morning and welcome to Bedworth Baptist Church on this very wet and miserable Sunday, 4th of October 2020. But very dry and even warm it feels in here. Our opening verse for the service today is 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12. I plead to God for help. O oh our God, won't you stop this? We are powerless against this might that is all about us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. Our eyes are focused on you. So let us pray. Father, we do indeed come before you. We're here, we're gathered, we're your people, and Lord, help us to focus on you. Not just our eyes, but our hearts, our minds. For 30 minutes, Lord, be amongst us, heal us, give us a shake to the things, Lord, that you want us to understand and here this morning. Amen. Amen. So, for those of you that don't know me, I think everybody does, but for the sake of the cameras, um, I'm Andy, I'm one of the deacons here, Mark's away this weekend, uh, so I've got the privilege of taking this service. So, by way of introduction, like many churches, we've looked at various ways to keep going. Keep in touch with one another, and trying new tools to help us in the midst of a pandemic that's all but shut many churches down. One of those tools is WhatsApp. It's a free computer program for use on smartphones that enables groups of people to communicate by messages left on a bulletin board for the rest of the group to see. Our Minister Mark set up the WhatsApp group in early June. It's simply called listening to God. The idea is that we're all part of the church body and we have different parts to play. Some are more discerning, some are more prophetic, some can bring a word, others are gifted prayers, some are more practical than others. And since its launch we've actively listened to God and noted what's been said. Now, if you're already on the WhatsApp group, you'll know exactly what I mean. But if you're not yet involved and want to be, please speak to Mark, who administers the WhatsApp group. In the midst of the pandemic, it's been helpful to know what we should be doing. Which way should we go? And how should we carry on? Should we go back and try to do things as before? Should we just stop for a bit? Or go off and do something else? On this journey, which, whether we like it or not, we're all on it, how do we maintain a grip on the road ahead? How should we proceed as individual Christians and as church people of the way? What exactly is at stake anyway? Well, in a nutshell, if we get this right and go the way God's showing us, all will be well. And we'll have some view of the way ahead. That's a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. But if we get this wrong, we risk missing a turn, becoming distracted along the way, or suffering some kind of crash. That's a paraphrase of Matthew 7, verse 24. On my left here, on the communion table, are lots of words of scripture, which have been shared in faith on our WhatsApp group. I've read three of them, including this one that I read to start with, already. For those who originally shared these words, it's been a step of faith, I'm sure, to do that. 
Everyone who has contributed has taken a risk in sharing an intimate moment with God. And this is the result. There's about 30 verses there. What I'd like then is for people to come up to the front and read these verses. There is power in declaring God's word aloud, to which we can all agree with an Amen. Treat today's short service as a moment of consolidation, a chance to reflect on what's been said before we proceed any further on the journey. Not least because there may be some who need to take urgent action before continuing on the way themselves. As we wait for the readings to be shared, we'll play some reflective hymns from Sid's funeral service earlier this week. James chapter 1 verses 2 to 6, Faith and Endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking, but when you do ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Acts 27 verses 13 to 15 A storm on the voyage When a light wind began to blow from the south, we thought we could make it, so we pulled up anchor and sailed along close to the shore. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster blew up far out to sea. We couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so we gave up and let it run before the game. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 to 20. A proclamation from the Lord for Israel. Forget the past, for I am about to do a brand new thing. See, I have already begun. Do you see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness for my people to come home. I will create rivers for them in the desert. Matthew 18, verses 19-20. Jesus is with us. I also tell you this, if two of you agree down here on earth concerning anything you ask of Father in heaven, he will do it for you. For where two or three gather together, because they are mine, I am there among them. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Put on your armour. Finally, be strong with the Lord's mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies and tricks of the devil. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. Use every piece of God's armour to resist the enemy in the time of evil so that after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the sturdy belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 27, 21-26, a storm on the voyage. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, 
Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left fair havens. You would have avoided all this injury and loss. But take courage. None of you will be lost, although the ship will be wrecked. For last night, an angel of God stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand before Caesar in Rome. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, and it will be just as he said. We will reach our destination, although we may suffer being shipwrecked on the way. Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus is with us. Obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am always with you, even unto the end of the age. Revelation 21, verse 5. The Lord is doing a new thing, and the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Psalm 32, verses 5 to 9. The Lord's leading. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly confess their rebellion to you while there is time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide, guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and a bridle to keep it under control. Isaiah 43, 1-2 a proclamation from the Lord for Israel. But now, O Israel, the Lord who created you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. The message of this service is about maintaining a grip on the road ahead. Staying on track and not becoming worn out or crashing out in the process. To demonstrate this, here's a short film that many of you may fondly remember from the early 1970s. Nice view from up here, Petunia. Yes, very nice, Joe. Worn tyres kill. Worn tyres kill? Are our tyres worn, Joe? Yeah, oh, I wouldn't think so, Petunia. Well, I expect you've looked. You have looked, haven't you, Joe? Joe, have you looked at our tyres? Uh, yes. Uh, Recently, Joe. <laughs> nice view from up here, Petunia. Joe, are our tyres worn? We're not worn, Petunia. They're a bit smooth. Oh, that's nice. Nice view from up here, Petunia. Yes, very nice, too. So on life's journey, which road are Joe and Petunia on? Proverbs 14.12 and 16.25 both state what road you think is the right one may lead to death. At the start of their journey, Joe says to his wife Petunia, it's a nice view from up here, and he was right, and from a great advantage point, they made a good start on the road ahead. But what was that road that lay ahead? 
By what perspective might they have seen the way ahead? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we live by faith and not by sight. We shouldn't see things as they are in the natural, but as they are in the supernatural. So how about the broad and easy road in life? So some of you may remember that I used this slide in the last service of 2018. I can't believe it was that long ago. And we were looking ahead then to 2019, 2020 and beyond. None of us knew then what was ahead. Obviously God did. And he told us, subsequently, to prepare to lay things aside that no longer mattered. To drop what was no longer useful. Two years on, those words make good sense. The book of Proverbs is full of godly advice on choosing the right road in life, as are many Psalms. But Jesus himself summarises it perfectly in his manifesto Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7.13. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose the easy way. And for the vast majority of people, life is a road from the past into the present and continues in the same way into the future without any reference to the way, the truth and the life of Jesus Christ. So how about the road of choice? From the world's perspective, all religions are just the same. They all lead to Rome, so to speak. However, that aside, many Christian believers also see this depiction as a common representation of the Christian walk too. We have free will to choose which path to go on. And through God's never-ending grace, he will accommodate that and duly follow us, beckoning his sheep on, whichever course we've chosen because God's created us with that free will to choose. Now on the WhatsApp group, um, I'm not a great contributor, more of a guest appearance now and again, I think. Uh, I did mention that I'm a Calvinist at heart, but I didn't qualify what that means. So here goes. John Calvin was a Protestant reformer of the 16th century following on from the Reformation where Protestants broke away from the dominant Catholic Church. Calvin understood everyone's free will to choose their way in life, but he also recognised God's destiny in, in us. He observed the many references in the Bible to one's calling, to the chosen, to the elect, so he surmised that there must be a limit to free will, insomuch that some men and women in the Bible were clearly chosen by God to have a specific calling, and that this was predetermined before they existed. Therefore, this divine destiny for man was given a name, predestination. Calvinism is much more than that, but predestination is what I was referring to on that WhatsApp. However, not all Protestant reformers thought like Calvin, so a formal alternative was put forward later by a Dutchman called Jacob Arminianus. And he made a strong argument for free will without limit. Ever since, there's been a debate whether God's predestination or man's free will has the greater pull on the Christian life. Now this isn't heresy. It's very, very close. So think of it as two sides of the same coin. You're not going to lose your salvation over this. But looking at this road of choice now, would this depict Calvinistic predestination, where there is one road of destiny, or Arminian free will, 
where there are many roads one can choose as a Christian. Or there's the narrow way. And to repeat Jesus' words from Matthew 7, 13 and 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The gateway to life is small and the road is narrow and only a few ever find it. Having been a committed Christian for over 30 years now, I'm convinced that this is the road of predestination that Calvin described as the Christian way. It's a very personal path that each of us follows. It may not be the best signposted, nor is it the most pleasant to walk at times. Our Minister Mark used this idea last week in his thought for the day when he referred to Psalm 23. Sometimes we do pass by still waters and green pastures, but sometimes we have to trudge through valleys of shadow and death. But walk in our destiny, we must, and overcome our free will to stop, turn around, or run away. So where did Joe and Petunia go wrong? Well, this film is from around about 1971. And most people in the census of that year declared themselves as Christian. So would we go further to say that Joe and Petunia were church people? Now this is the age before PC. And PC back in the 70s meant a bobby on Z cars. It didn't mean political correctness. And people were often judged at face value. Now I shudder that we would ever do that today since equality of 2010. But let's indulge ourselves, just for a moment. Let's step back in time and do a spot of stereotyping. Just look at them. Are they Baptists, Anglicans, or Wesleyan reformists? <laughs> now as Baptists, our background is in Calvinism. Methodists, it's Arminian. Yeah, so that nobody's, we're not saying anybody's right or wrong, but which is the better way? So I reckon, because they started from a high point, and they were travelling on a single track road, without turning off, they've got to be Calvinists. Persevering through all kinds of storms in life. Because it lashed it down at one point, didn't it? But then disaster. So, although they were Calvinistic Baptists, they lost their way and crashed. So, what are our basic tie checks for the way ahead? There's not a spelling mistake on that. <coughs> First of all, thinking about our tread. Tread is where the rubber hits the road. So it's got to be good. So we need to be treading in the steps of Jesus. We need to be under some pressure. No one can run flat for long. So we need to be filled with the Spirit. We need the Spirit in our sails from time to time so we know when that direction is changing. And we've got to get our balance and alignment right. Does everybody recognise this on the wheel? Yeah, about 60 miles an hour. Or if the wheels aren't aligned, we're going to rip the tread, certainly on one of the tyres, if not both of them. So don't wobble at the wheel. And don't be pulled aside. Always weigh the word and align yourself with it. 
For man does not live on bread alone. So are you worn out, running flat, unbalanced or misaligned? I'm sure there's a church for you. If you don't stop and sort it, there's a crash coming up. So pull over and sort it out. If you need a brush of fresh air, then take it. If you need to check your bearings, then ask. Get your map out. Pray about it or open the Bible. Or have you lost your way completely? Then go back and find the point at which you took that wrong turn. Good passage here is 2 Kings chapter 6, 1 to 7. This is about the missing axe head, the axe head that got lost, and Ken preached on that some weeks ago. So on life's journey, which road are you on? At the beginning I said that the message of this service is about maintaining a grip on the road ahead. Staying on track and not being worn out or crashing in the process. Yes, it is for you personally, but it's also for us corporately as a church body. The difference is that you are at liberty to exercise your own free will with your destiny. But no one should be at liberty to exercise their free will with this church's destiny. Indeed, your life is no longer your own. You have been bought at a price, a very high one. And that's 1 Corinthians 6.20. This church is bigger than any one of us. And it's our responsibility to seek God's will for us as a body. We must stay on the narrow way, predestined for Bedworth Baptist Church, and not lose our way. If you're a member of this church, you're already part of this body by default. If you're not a member, but feel called to be part of it, then please speak to Mark or one of the deacons. Not just for your sake, but for ours, because your destiny, your destiny will certainly be tied to the church's destiny. And the quicker you recognise that, the better for everyone. Ultimately, it's no longer you, but Christ who lives in you, that determines how you act. That's Galatians 2.20. I'd like us to close with the words of Psalm 23. 